Good afternoon and welcome to Energin's webinar. My name is Daphna, I'm a part of the marketing team and I'll be your host for today. In today's webinar, we'll present Snipro, Energin's new line of pre-designed genotyping solution that was launched last month. This solution will be available for various crops with soy being the first in line, so it's relevant even if you're working on other crops. To validate the results of Soy Snipro, we have collaborated with the University of Missouri, utilizing their soy breeding program. Through, its project result, through this project result, we'll learn more about Soy Snipro and its advantages. We'll save time for questions at the end of the webinar, so please type in your questions during the presentation using the question tab on the left of the screen. This webinar is also being recorded and will be posted on our website in case you want to listen to it once again. It's my pleasure to present today's speakers. Our first speaker, Dr. Pian Yan Chen from the University of Missouri. Dr. Chen serves as a faculty member in the Plant Science Division, College of Agriculture, Food and Natural Resources, and holds the D.M. Hegard Edward Professorship in Soybean Breeding and Genetics. His research focuses on soybean cultivar development and germplasm enhancement. I would also like to welcome Dr. Ed Bergman. Ed is a Director of Genomic Solution at Energin. He works with all customers dedicated to plant and animal invest in improvement to develop projects and match Energin's capabilities to customers' needs. Ed received his PhD in chemistry from the University of California, Berkeley, followed by postdoctoral training at the National Institute of Health. Dr. Chen, the stage is yours. Thank you. Uh, I want to take a moment to appreciate uh, the organizer and everybody in the audience for this opportunity uh, to discuss uh, a possibility of uh, using molecular tools in you know, predictive breeding to uh, enhance our breeding program and improve our breeding efficiency and overall genetic gain. Well, I'm going to use uh, uh, University of Missouri the breeding program as example or pilot project, if you will. Uh, this is a joint effort uh, working with NRGs uh, along the course of last about a year or a year and a half. So uh, we are very pleased to share some of the thoughts we have, observations, and, uh, and the progress towards our goal. Uh, let me see, I can. Well, this program at uh, University of Missouri has been very successful and well known uh, for decades because this program is led by Dr. Grover Shana. I'm sure many of the audience today probably recognize his name, not, not, not mine. So I came to this program about five years ago. As any other public breed program, we, we work on pretty much the similar things, yield, uh, yield stability and you know maturity and zones adaptation local and regional adaptations and disease problems all kinds of nematodes and and uh, abiotic stress such as drought flooding salt and and then lately I think there's herbicide the drift damage issues we have to deal with and then of course everybody trying to improve the seed composition along the way and then in some of the part public programs in the US, uh, we start using the latest technology, uh, such as uh, extend and uh, enlist uh, package in our building program. Not everybody has that the luxury, but the University of Missouri, uh, we started this effort about a couple of years ago. Now, uh, as I said, as a public program, everybody pretty much dealing with a, uh, this, a similar scope of uh, a program working on different trades. And in Missouri, we do have some unique problems. One of the problems we have is the root knot nematode, which is a certain disease. And it really causing about somewhere between 10 to 15 bushels yield penalty uh, if there's a stress or, or pressure, right? And then we have a zero grade heavy clay soil with poor drainage and then oftentimes we have a challenge of 
water logging and flooding situations. Uh, so, uh, uh, so we 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 had to deal with that from uh, the breeding standpoint. And then, uh, since about four or five years ago, we have uh, faced another new challenge with the extent technology in the market. And then we have a serious uh, herbicide drift damage uh, on our research farm. So we were able to work on some of the natural tolerance trait selections in our breeding program. So. Uh, here is probably a, a, a rough scheme, a breeding scheme, or a roadmap for a lot of public program in the US. Basically, you start with a crossing block with a, a set of select parents. You make all the magic imagination to, to make a, a number of crosses, and they move into the e breeding program, allow all the genes to sort out and recombine, hoping that you have a a new genetic recommendation uh, in your progeny. And then when the progeny reach the whole full uh, homozygosity and homogeneity, you select a pure line and enter them in a preliminary yield trial and probably select about 10 to 15% of the baselines and then advance to the advanced trials and then regional trials before you release uh, a variety. So that's pretty much a, a, a scheme everybody follows. And then in terms of the influx of breeding materials uh, in numbers, uh, you know, this is probably a, a number on a larger size. You know, you know, generally a program probably makes 100 to 300 process. In our case, it's about 200. So you end up somewhere around, you know, 20 to 30,000 project rows, which is probably a five generation. And you select about you know eight to ten percent and move on to the yield trial about twenty five hundred lines you have to deal with every year and then uh, select the top ten and move two hundred fifty advanced lines in in an advanced trial with replications in multiple locations and then from there you see cut the select the best lines maybe twenty five thirty also move to the original test uniform trials of right testing programs and then you confidently select maybe only one or two or three lines uh, for release purpose so again that is just a, a, a average number i'm showing there on the screen uh, as well know that you know the, the breeding is is a long-term uh, effort and it's a continuous concurrent process you have all the stage mixing every single year so it is a cyclic and a linear progressive process you're dealing with you have new crosses made but near any process coming out from pipeline uh, anything if you train you have to deal with it's really the huge numbers game and uh, as a practical breeder i view this whole discipline is an art science and now you have an engineer involved and i'm sure in my lifetime and career lifetime Career tenure time is probably a luck. <laughs> sometimes get lucky, sometimes I don't. And it's all boils down to the resource management, either it'll be a financial labor or space, time. And it's really a competitive race uh, with public, private entities, and uh, with yourself. You have to move things fast. It's all about how you're going to win this game. So, uh, the first numbers game is here. I'm going to put a list of the numbers game as a multiple, the plural form of the numbers game, right? You're dealing with how many parents you're going to select and put in the crossing block. And then the next thing you're going to think about how many crosses you're going to make with the parents, right? And then how many populations you move on, how many plants you select from each population, and then from there, how many progeny rows in pure line form you can select visually, and then you, you, you Enter the how many entries in your yield trials, and you have replications, locations, and number of years, those all as a numbers in the game. So it's fairly complicated, a numbers game. Now, the first challenge as a breeder is that, you know, I can randomly select some parents I think are very good parents, and I'm hoping that I can cross them, need to cross them, and have something new, right? If you have 10 parents, you you can get 
45 crops, right? If you do 50 pounds, you get 1,200 crosses. If you increase your pounds to 100, you get five, almost 5,000 crosses. And usually in our program, about 200 to 300 uh, pounds, and they can make 19,000 19, uh, to 25,000 crosses, which is really a number that you cannot even live up with. So it is a challenge how do you control the number in a manage, uh, manageable manner. So, and the other complication is that we, we move our population to a homozygous state or homogeneous phase and then select a line for year evaluation for potential release. However, this, this number is given as another layer, which is how many trade you're dealing with. Every time you add a trade you are working on, you really increase the degree of difficulty by four times because the, the number of genes you're dealing with uh, and also generations you're dealing with. So I guess I'm not going to in detail. So here's a summary of my career, either the successful career or failure, but I'm going to just give you the, the facts. You know, I've been in Virginia Tech for 10 years, so I'm making about 120 crosses a year. Over the 10 years, made uh, 1,200 crosses, and then moved to Arkansas, 15 years, 200 crosses a year, and 3,000 crosses total. And then I've been in Missouri for the last five years. I'm, I'm doing pretty good moving out, make 300 crosses, okay? And so I made, what, 1,500 crosses in the last five years. So I go on a linear progression, right? I increase the numbers, hoping that I can increase my success rate, right? And you know what? It's if you look at the 30 year total, so I release on 50, 56 varieties. So the success rate is pretty much the same, the less than 1%. So I'm playing a guessing game. It is a random thing I'm doing. So 99% of the time, I'm wasting my time and somebody's, somebody's time in the program too. So no matter what you do, your success rate is about 1% or less, right? If you look at the progenies you deal with, right? Move to the F4, F5 generation. So in my last 30 years, I did 570,000 progeny rows. So, so re with 56 release, the successful rate is one out of 10,000. So it's even worse. So how do we improve our predicting ability and quality? in a breeding program. So we have been uh, trying playing with uh, some molecular tools, right? With genotyping our parents. We find that the most successful parents in the past. We, and then we, we use some of the historic data to predict uh, as a training population and see if we can predict, uh, you know, from the phenotype data to see their, you know, potential as a line. And from there, we move on to the yield trial and then go to the next cycle. So this basically a, a, a strategy that we're trying to use, we cut off the phenotypic uh, evaluation part from progeny row to the, the first year preliminary drive, PYT. So they cut two years and cut a lot of them, 30,000 versus 2,500 with replications. So there's a lot of numbers that you have two years time invested. We're trying to cut those out so we can decrease us cycle uh, of the breeding program here, therefore increase the, the breeding efficiency. So there's a big slide, you know the, the, the left side, basically there's a, a, a summary of what we do as I covered in the previous slide from crossing to, to write a release, right? This takes about six years to complete a cycle, right? Now with the strategy of working with NRG, you see we can cut this breeding cycle by two years. So look at the green, we start with crossing block, and then we send out progenies in winter nursery. We start genotyping F3 generation, right? So you can do 30 day a cycle. So you, you're able to do F3 genotyping before they come back to the home station for selection, right? And then use that uh, genotypic data to predict their, uh, you know, their performance. Instead of going to progeny row, you go through a viewer selection and do a POIT so, and then you go strictly to the advanced trial. So where you're there, you do the genotyping, you increase the seed at the same time. So you'll, you'll be to cut the whole cycle by two years. 
all right so uh here is the here is the 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 principal uh, rationale behind this approach so we know uh, pretty much the heritability is a proportion of uh, your gene genetic variance over the, the phenotype the overall variance right is 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 everybody knows that and then the genetic gain is defined as heritability product heritability by selection differential selection differential it is what it is a selection efficiency no i'm sorry selection uh, selection intensity all right it depends how much what's the proportion of the lines you select uh, and by the uh, heritability so this poor cycle right genetic gain if you're talking about genetic gain per year there's a year number y as a denominator right so this whole strategy we're trying to increase the selection intensity using genetic marker data so therefore we're using a parental selection and number of crossing combinations to try to increase the the genetic variance and then decrease the number of years per cycle. So therefore, we can increase the genetic uh, uh, selection, uh, selection power in terms of number of things we can handle from parental selections to crosses to make progenies move on. Remember, historically, people move top 10, 12, 15%. Now, can we do one to 2%? from F3 generation on. So you can imagine that you can reduce the numbers uh, quite a bit, right? And you can narrow down the number of parents you deal with, number of crosses you're, you're making, not in a random fashion, but kind of in a predictive fashion, right? And you can move the progeny faster, and then you can increase the uh, selection uh, accuracy. So with all this selection power combined, so you can improve uh, your breeding efficiency and genetic gain over time. So this project started about a year, year and a half ago. Uh, Kyle, my PhD student, now he's a full-time research specialist as well. He spent quite time uh, on this project, working with the AR genes and uh, Dr. Diago uh, Hargi in the U University of Nebraska. So we sent a, about 2,200 progeny rows derived by about 20 some crosses, okay? Uh, DNA samples from our progenies to NR genes, and then they did the phenotyping, they did the imputation. Ed is going to address that. And then the data came, uh, went to Dr. Hargi in Nebraska, and he helped us to analyze data based on our uh, past almost 1,500 yield. Uh, data from historically about 820 advanced lines using using a training population and they came out with the top performing lines he predicted using the models and then Kyle and I went to the field to select the top 10 percent of lines so we have that together now so the next step 2022 we're going to grow those select lines from Dr. Harkin's selection and also our visual as a breeder selection and we're going to compare and see how close our way are we 50 percent matching or 80 percent or 85 percent matching right if so i think that we can probably uh you know gradually move into the this molecular uh marker data based uh, breeding strategy so and i add is going to share with uh nrg portion that uh, using a, a, a low density in the markers to help reduce the cost so with that i'll probably leave the questions to the end and then turn over to dr ed brockman and to uh, uh, share with you the nrg portion of the research effort thank you Uh, thank you. This is Ed Bruggeman from Energene. Uh, I can't advance my slides yet. Oh, here we go. 
I am going to talk about our SNP Pro product for a couple of minutes, and then I will return to the collaboration that we established with the University of Missouri. But first, let me take a moment and introduce Energene, if you are not already familiar with the company. Uh, Energene was formed about 10 years ago. We are an agricultural biotechnology company that focuses on genomics and genetics. Uh, we're based in Israel, uh, but we have a large customer base uh, extending over 30 countries. Uh, we've done a lot of projects in those countries over the years. Uh, and we have done a lot of projects in a lot of species. Uh, you can see on this slide that the species count is 79. Most of those species are crops and plant species, uh, but some of these species also cover animals and livestock, uh, as well as species that are common in aquaculture. So Energene is active in all areas of agricultural production. Today, we're gonna to talk about genotyping. And the reason that we're gonna talk about genotyping is that genotyping has become increasingly important in breeding activities in crop plants, as well as animals and aquaculture. Uh, today, uh, the most advanced breeding programs use molecular breeding methods, including genomic selection. Uh, and those methods typically require uh, extensive genotyping within breeding populations. That level of genotyping can, ask, can add a, a, a significant cost and complexity to a breeding program, uh, which can be a barrier to getting into these advanced molecular techniques. Uh, and so the genotyping approach that uh, we present here with SNP Pro uh, is an attempt to reduce, uh, if not eliminate, uh, those barriers for performing uh, molecular breeding in ag agriculture. So when we put together SNP Pro, uh, we thought of a number of things that we wanted to achieve and we felt that we could achieve them. Uh, and we were thinking about this from the perspective of a breeding program. Most importantly for us were things that were on the right. Uh, we wanted to reduce the cost of genotyping in a breeding program. Uh, and we wanted to reduce the complexity of performing that genotyping. Uh, which depends on sample submission, genotyping, and data processing, all of which have to be done within a specified turnaround time, which we also need to keep at a minimum. And for the benefit of a breeding program, ultimately what we want to do is reduce the resources that are used to manage genotypic data so that those resources can be used for other purposes. The left-hand side of the slide describes a few things that we wanted to improve or maximize. Um, the first is the amount of genotypic data that a customer could obtain, the quality of that data, and the informativeness of that genotypic data. All breeding programs want to increase the number of new recombinants that they screen, uh, and we want to improve that also. Uh, and we want to achieve a certain level of end-to-end -end stability and consistency in this process so that it can proceed smoothly without undue attention and delays. Uh, and finally, any resources that are saved on the genotyping side uh, that's uh, outlined on the right here can be used to invest in uh, collecting, managing, and analyzing phenotypic data. Uh, and this is really important because uh, although for molecular breeding, both genotypic and phenotypic data are required, uh, in my opinion, the real challenge in breeding today still is the phenotypic characterization of new recombinants rather than the genotypic characterization. And so we need to reserve as many resources as possible for phenotypic uh, characterization and reduce the resource investment into genotyping to the full extent possible. So what is SNP Pro exactly? Uh, in concept, SNP Pro comprises really just two things. 
Uh, one is a plex that has been optimized to genotype samples at low density. And this low density, this low SNP density, minimizes the cost of genotyping. Uh, genotyping is a laboratory process, and the cost of genotyping scales not linearly, but very strongly with the number of loci that are genotyped, as well as the number of samples that are genotyped. So with a PLEX development that minimizes the number of SNPs on the PLEX, that helps to reduce the cost of genotyping that's incurred in the lab. The second is a pipeline to impute data to high SNP density. Uh, and this maximizes the data and makes the data uh, fully informative for the purposes for which it's intended. Now, data imputation uh, is uh, something that depends only, has only a weak uh, correlation with the number of loci that are genotyped or the number of samples that are genotyped. And so the combination of a low density plex with a pipeline for imputation is a combination which allows a, a breeder to minimize the cost of genotyping and yet maximize the amount of informative data that's obtained from that genotyping uh, to support molecular breeding activities. Specifically today, uh, SNP Pro Soy comprises a couple of plexes. We have a plex of 500 SNPs that is optimized for northern U.S. breeding germplasm, that's the 500N plex. And another plex uh, that is optimized for southern U.S. breeding germplasm, which is the 500S plex. These two plexes can be combined to improve the imputation accuracy, and the result would be a 900 plex. Uh, the 500 plus 500 does not add up to 1,000 because there are approximately 100 SNPs that are shared between the two plexes, uh, and hence the 500. So these are the actual PLEX options that are available today. You can advance, go ahead. Uh, I would like to take a moment uh, to discuss data imputation. If you are not familiar with data imputation or you are a statistician who uses data imputation frequently, but perhaps uses it in a different context. The upper part of this panel um, describes the conventional idea of data imputation where real data coming from a lab or from the field or anything else frequently contains missing data. Often the statistical analysis that are applied to these data are quite um, uh, sophisticated uh, and not robust in the presence of missing data. And so techniques have been, involved, have been developed to allow the imputation of data, uh, often in a neutral way, to complete a data set so that the statistical analysis can proceed without any undue problems uh, and uh, useful results are obtained from those. The type of data imputation that we're talking about here for SNP Pro is slightly different. We are not so concerned about imputing missing data as we are about imputing missing loci. Uh, we do not genotype all the loci that a breeder might require to do molecular breeding or genomic selection. We only genotype a minority of those loci, and then we impute the rest of the loci. So that is genetic imputation, which focuses on missing loci rather than missing data. Uh, and the result is effectively a complete data set, which is achieved at very low laboratory cost due to the imputation uh, of all of these data. So how was Soy SNP Pro developed? Uh, I'll discuss this a little bit here. Um, the goals uh, specifically, which I haven't yet addressed, were to develop an SNP plex for soy that comprised 500 SNPs. And the secondary goal uh, of imputation was to impute uh, 6,000 SNPs, the SNPs that are present on the soy 6K plex. We cho chose the soy 6K plex as our imputation target because it is such a common plex and is so familiar to soy breeding programs, uh, both in the US uh, and also in South America. 
and the 500 SNPs that would occur in our plex would be a subset from the soy 6K plex. The input data for this process of development uh, is outlined at the lower left of this slide. Uh, we used publicly available data. Um, in particular, we use the USDA soybean germplasm collection, which has been genotyped uh, with the 50K plex. That comprises uh, approximately 20,000 accessions. Now, most of those accessions are not usable to us. We focused on accessions that were directly relevant to U.S. soy breeding germplasm over the last few decades. Uh, and we used a couple of different public sources uh, to uh, allow us to focus in on the accessions that would be most useful to us. Uh, two sources were the Uniform Soybean Test Reports uh, over a three-year period from 2017 to 2019. The entries, parents, and grandparents of those entries were used. Uh, we also uh, used the literature that is available, uh, which has uh, very well documented the base of U.S. soy breeding germplasm uh, and knowledge of the commercial lines that are commonly in use today. The process of plex development was an iterative process that is outlined in the upper right. Uh, we sought to optimize plexes from 100 to 1,000 SNPs. To test the plexes, uh, we simulated F4 populations from our, um, our materials and uh, estimated the imputation accuracy. Uh, and based on what we saw, we went through iterations of this process of uh, optimizing SNPs uh, and then uh, evaluating those optimized SNPs based on imputation accuracy. Uh, and this is an important point that I would like to emphasize. Uh, ultimately, the plexes that we ended up with, the final plexes that are uh, detailed at the bottom right, these plexes were not developed in a way to uh, achieve some sort of genomic uniformity for SNPs or any other criteria, although you'll see in a moment that we did achieve genomic uniformity for the most part. The criteria here for optimization was the imputation accuracy. And so as we went through these iterations of optimization and imputation, the plexes that we ended up with of 500 SNPs were plexes that are optimized to impute to the 6K plex. And as such, uh, we believe they are the best 500 uh, uh, SNPs for imputation to the 6K plex that can be achieved by subsetting the 6K plex itself. The two plexes, the 500N plex and the 500S plex, each uh, contain 402 unique SNPs, unique to each plex. Uh, and then as I mentioned a moment ago, there are 98 SNPs that are shared on the two plexes. So the two plexes are different for the most part, uh, with 20% of the SNPs shared on the two. Let's move to the next slide. <clears throat> so this slide shows the genomic distribution of the SNPs. Uh, the upper panel shows the northern plex. The bottom panel shows the southern plex. We have all uh, 20 uh, chromosomes from soy represented here. And the blue dots indicate the SNPs that are present on the plexes. And you can see that the distribution of SNPs across the, uh, the 20 chromosomes of maize is pretty good uh, and uniform. Uh, I will highlight, however, two chromosomes, chromosome 5 and chromosome 13. If you look at them closely, it appears that there are more SNPs on our plexes for those two chromosomes than there are for the other 18 chromosomes for both the northern plex and the southern plex. Uh, and that impression is quite true. Uh, when we started this process, we were using approximately equal numbers of SNPs on all the chromosomes. Chromosomes 5 and chromosome 13 turned out to be particularly challenging for imputation. Uh, and as we went through uh, the iterations of optimization and testing, 
uh, we uh, accumulated more SNPs on chromosome 5 and on chromosome 13 than on the other chromosomes. Uh, and ultimately, as I'll show you in a moment, we got very good and uniform imputation across all of the chromosomes with this distribution. <clears throat> so this is an example of our imputation uh, accuracy that we uh, 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 produced during our iterations uh, of development. Uh, so we have distributions here that are represented by box plots uh, oriented in a vertical fashion. On the left, we see northern germplasm uh, with the northern plex, and on the right, we see the southern plex on southern germplasm. In both cases here, we simulated uh, 10,000 F4 progeny uh, from many different crosses that we made of the materials that we had, uh, and we measured the imputation accuracy. And you can see that the imputation accuracy, the median level, is around 97%. Uh, and there are very few uh, samples that fall below uh, our threshold of 95% accuracy in both of these simulations. Uh, although we do not show the box plots, there is a note at the bottom here which shows that uh, if we combine the two plexes and then do imputation, the imputation accuracy is slightly larger. Uh, the increase in imputation accuracy, though, going from 500 SNPs to 900 SNPs is uh, quite small. Uh, it amounts to about 1%, uh, but the cost that is incurred by uh, genotyping a significantly higher number of markers is significant, uh, and in my opinion, it is generally uh, not justified by the incremental gain in imputation accuracy. This uh, slide shows the imputation accuracy from the previous slide, but simply broken out into the 20 chromosomes of maize, and you see that the imputation is relatively uniform across all of the 20 chromosomes of soy. And I think, good. Uh, uh, I have circled the two chromosomes that I discussed earlier, chromosome 5 and chromosome 13. And with the additional markers that we placed on those chromosomes, we get imputation accuracy for those chromosomes, uh, which is consistent with the other 18 chromosomes for both the northern plex and the southern plex. Okay, now I would like to return to the collaboration that we uh, established with the University of Missouri. Uh, Dr. Chen mentioned a moment ago that we have been talking uh, for a, a long time. I think we first met in 2020, fairly early in 2020, to discuss uh, what we could do for the University of Missouri as they went into genomic selection. Uh, and so we established this collaboration, which has certainly been very productive for us, and I believe also for the University of Missouri. We basically had two objectives. Uh, the first was to provide the University of Missouri with 6K data uh, from which uh, they could initiate their genomic selection program, uh, initially at a small scale, but with a with an eye towards uh, increasing it over several years. Uh, for us, it provided us with the opportunity uh, to gain experimental data that we could use to validate our imputation pipeline. Uh, the outline of the collaboration is shown here. The University of Missouri provided us with materials, uh, a little over 2,000 F4 progeny from 23 breeding populations. Uh, as well as the parents of those breeding populations. And the number of unique parents for these 23 breeding populations was 33. Uh, and all of these parents, uh, all of these populations, excuse me, were biparental populations. Uh, these materials were genotyped uh, by both the University of Missouri and Energene. Uh, the 2000 F4 progeny were genotyped with the SNP Pro. Uh, uh, 500NPLEX, and 278 progeny were also genotyped with the 500SPLEX, and the reasons for that I will describe in a few minutes. And the 33 parents were genotyped with the soy 6KPLEX. 
after all of these materials had been genotyped and the genotypic data uh, was uh, pulled together uh, into a single unit, Energene performed an analysis. Uh, the first thing that we did, uh, which is not about imputation specifically, but is about the data, is a data QC. Uh, we look at progeny consistency and the genotypic uh, error detection and correction. I'll talk about consistency, uh, but not about genotypic error. We then imputed the soy 6K plex after we discarded some progeny and some populations based on our data QC. And then we estimated the imputation accuracy for those 278 progeny that were genotyped with the 500S plex. So this is an example of the data that we developed when we looked at consistency. So consistency is a metric that extends from zero to one. And for each progeny, it expresses the number of loci genotyped uh, which, uh, uh, for which the allele that was inherited was inherited from one of the two parents of the population. Uh, the converse inconsistency uh, represents uh, uh, SNP loci that contain an allele that could not have been inherited from either of the two parents of that population. On the left, we see the distribution of the consistency metric across all 20, uh, 2,000 samples, and it's somewhat bimodal. Uh, the majority of samples are on the right with a consistency level above 0.95. Uh, and then we see that there are a lot of samples that have much lower levels of consistency, which indicate that those uh, progeny samples uh, likely did not arise from a cross of the two parents to which they are assigned, or conversely, uh, one or both of those parents is somehow incorrect for the population. It's interesting to take those inconsistencies and look at them on a population level. And on the right, we do that. This histogram shows the distribution of inconsistent samples by population. Uh, and so we have 23 populations, and we see that for five populations, uh, all of the progeny for those populations were classified as inconsistent. And we also see that there were four populations which had 100% consistent progeny. Uh, and then for the remainder of the populations, there was a low or moderate level of inconsistencies. This type of result is uh, a little bit surprising, but perhaps not so uh, in my experience when a large breeding program is first genotyped at this level. Uh, often uh, it is revealed that some of the progeny um, have been assigned incorrectly or mistakes have crept into the process of handling these materials in the field, in a seed handling facility, or sampling from genotyping. Uh, and it's very important before any imputation is uh, actually performed to identify these issues uh, and set them aside uh, so that the imputations take place on progeny samples that are uh, uh, well documented to be progeny of the parents to which they have been assigned. Now, my next slide here, I summarize the imputation accuracy uh, in a single uh, uh, box plot, again, arranged vertically as I do on the previous slide. Uh, and we see here that 94% uh, of the samples of the 278 progeny for which we did this had imputation accuracies above 90%. The imputation accuracy is basically estimated by comparing two sources of data. Uh, we are using uh, 402 SNP loci and 278 progeny. So the total result here is based on over 100,000 data points. The first source of our data here is data points that were imputed from the 500 NPLEX. The 402 loci that we're working with here are not represented on the 500 NPLEX, and so we can only obtain data from those by imputation uh, in this experiment. But these 402 loci are present on the 500 SPLEX, and that's why we genotyped with the 500 SPLEX so that we could get uh, direct observations by genotyping for these same loci, and we can compare them for 
discordant observations, and that's how we determine the accuracy of the imputation. Uh, one of the disadvantages of this method of imputation is it unfortunately underestimates the true accuracy of imputation, and that's due to the fact that the uh, SNPs that were chosen for the plexes are SNPs that show the greatest amount of equilibrium amongst themselves, uh, which makes them the most difficult uh, SNPs to impute from one another. Uh, and so for that reason here, we are establishing a floor for the imputation accuracy. The true imputation accuracy is likely higher than what we have represented here. So uh, finally, before I close, uh, I would like to uh, thank the University of Missouri uh, for providing the materials and the effort that they went through uh, 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 in the collaboration with us. Uh, it was certainly a very productive collaboration. Uh, and I think scientifically rewarding for both sides. I would like to remind the audience uh, of some of the advantages that we are offering with SNP Pro here. This is a product that is available today for soy, uh, and you can uh, minimize your cost and complexity of genotyping with it, maximize your data, maximize the informativeness of the data, and maximize your data quality. Uh, and uh, we do a lot of that work for you uh, in this process. We do provide a complete service, so all you have to do is submit samples, and then you will get imputed data in return that has already been QC'd, uh, and we seek to achieve the fastest turnaround times possible, and we can work with you on a case-by-case -case basis if the four weeks uh, is not acceptable. And ultimately, this is a product that will allow you to free up resources from genotyping for molecular breeding and allow them those resources to be invested as you see fit elsewhere in your program. Uh, so with that, I am done and I am going to turn this back over to Daphna and I think that she will moderate the question. Hi. Uh, so thank you, Ed. Uh, I believe we have some time uh, for a few questions from the audience. Um, so the first one is for Dr. Chen. How much improvement do you expect by switching from a conventional to a prediction-based breeding pipeline? Okay, uh, well, this uh, is a very good question. We, we don't have the answer yet. So, uh, so we hope that by having the yield data from 2022, we'll be answered the question fully. But as a, as, as a speculation that the predict breeding model is going to reduce a numbers in terms of parents for crossing, a number of crosses going through, and a number of uh, plants or progeny is going to grow. And then also you limit uh, two generations in the process. So we, we don't have the, the final data to support this hypothesis yet, but I think we're, at, at this point, based on our gene data versus our predictive model, so we have a high percent of matching, but we have to have collect yield data to support, uh, you know, the data we have so far. So that'll be another, another year from now, I guess. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Next question is for Ed. Um, so why stop at 6K SNPs? Is it possible to impute the entire soy 50K plex from the soy SNP 500 North and 500 South plex? Uh, well, the short answer is yes. Uh, we can impute the entire 500K, uh, excuse me, uh, 50K plex uh, from our uh, 500 plexes. Uh, we typically talk about imputing to the 6K plex because uh, based on our understanding and our experience, that is the, the set of SNPs that is most widely used uh, and is probably sufficient for most molecular breeding purposes. Uh, but if somebody uh, wishes to get imputation to a higher level than that, all the way up to the 50K plex, uh, we can certainly do that. Thank you, Ed. Uh, next question is for you, Dr. Chen. 
what would you say is the greatest limiting step in your breeding program? What is the greatest limiting step in applying genomic selection? Well, good question. I think the bottleneck of breeding program uh, to be efficient and accurate is just the uh, the progeno stage, right? So uh, we we're playing a random a guessing game there. So breeders just look at what plant type maturity, uh, you know, standard being allowed you or not, and then they like it or not like it. Okay, so this is really a rough estimate. We don't have enough data to see the ones we select that really represent the true potential. So that's the bottleneck. And next bottleneck along the lines, next the, your vigorous selection go to yield trial, and then that's a random process too, right? So uh, I think those are two years of the you know time in the breeding cycle is really pretty much wasted. If we can go straight from genomic prediction using the marker data, so we we can increase our selection intensity by not going to select 15%, right? And then we can we do based on 1%. That's where the success rate is. Basically on our traditional breeding, your success rate is about 1%. So can we increase the, uh, selection intensity from the progenies and better yet if we if we everything works out can we predict uh, your crossing success by using the parental molecular data so that part it remains to be seen we don't know yet so if we can do that we can predict the parents and their combinations and then combine with the predicted breeding cutting off the progeny row and the first year yield trial and then you will be a much better place uh, to be more successful in, in improving the breeding efficiency and the genetic gain over time. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Um, the next question is for you, Ed. Are you developing SNPRO plexes for other crops? If so, what other crops? Uh, yes, we are. Uh, we are in the process of developing um, this SNP Pro concept for canola uh, and for wheat. Uh, and we are actively uh, considering doing it for other crops too. Uh, a lot depends on uh, what we see as the potential for a SNP Proplex in different crops as well as our own developmental capacity. Um, but yes, there's nothing that prevents us from developing this in other crops, and we are in the process of doing so. Thank you, Ed. Um, so you, um, we have another question for you, Ed. Uh, you developed soy snipro using U.S. breeding materials and data. Can soy snipro be used in South America, Brazil, Argentina programs as well? Uh, we believe so, uh, based on everything that we know uh, about South American uh, soy breeding germplasm, uh, the ancestor lines that were incorporated, uh, its heavy dependence in the early days on U.S. breeding germplasm. Uh, we believe that the plexes that we have developed will be informative in uh, South American soy germplasm and that the imputations that we do from those plexes will be accurate. Uh, we do not have, at the moment, however, any type of experimental validation uh, for this. We are working with a partner in South America so that we can develop a, a project to genotype and impute a broad range of Brazilian soy breeding germplasm. Uh, and from that, we will then have an experimental result, uh, which we would be happy to share uh, with uh, this audience at a future time uh, or with anybody who would like to have that information. Uh, so we are actively uh, proceeding in that direction. Uh, if anybody has an interest uh, and uh, works with South American breeding materials, of course, we'd be happy to talk with them uh, about setting up a project too for their materials uh, if they thought that was advantageous. Thank you, Ed. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, we couldn't answer all your question. 
uh, but we will make sure to answer all of them uh, by email. Um, at this note, I'd like to thank our speakers for their time today and for sharing their insights and expertise. Uh, this webinar was recorded and we will uh, have it available on our website and you will also get an email with the link to the recording. Uh, if you have any further questions or wish to see how Sniper fits your breeding program, please don't hesitate to contact us. Thank you for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your day.